21. The feed went to black, and Zoe started to take off the glasses. Armando asked her what the hell was going on, but another video started and she shushed him once more. The date on this recording was about two months ago. The feed picked up inside a moving car, rolling through downtown Tabula Rasa. Will Blackwater was behind the wheel, and the camera had started recording him in mid-sentence. I guess a lot of them get moldy in storage. They're all canvas, you know. And the 10th Street warehouse flooded last spring. They're fine, they just smell bad. They'll air out by Halloween. Arthur, who once again was unseen behind the camera, said, In the snow! You get that all lined out! Had to reserve five more machines from a resort in Park City for some obscene amount of money, but yes, it's all a go. Echo has the running itemization if you want to check out how much this is costing you. Why would I ever want to do that? And then, Will did something Zoe had never seen him do in the couple of days she had known him. He smiled. Will cranked the wheel and shifted into park, driving the car the old-fashioned way. They had arrived, but the camera's viewing angle didn't make it clear where they were. Arthur said, You do a good job, Will. All of you do. I won't say it enough. Yes, when it comes to party planning, you probably won't find three, four billion people in the world at it better than me. You know what I mean, smartass. I appreciate you what you guys do. Just day to day. There was a silence that Will seemed uncomfortable with. Finally, he said, That scene's car, right? Are we waiting for somebody else? Just going over the game plan in my head. I need to relax. I didn't do my yoga this morning. Will laughed. Some kind of private joke between them. Here, said Arthur. Do the thing with the coin. Arthur's hand came into frame, palming the one-sided lucky coin Arthur had made a point of leaving to Zoe. Will took it and showed it to the camera, holding it between finger and thumb. He passed his other hand in front of it, and it was gone. He held up both hands like a magician, showing they were empty, the coin nowhere to be found. Amazing! Even knowing how you do it, I can't see you do it! Will, without cracking a smile, reached down the front of his pants and produced the coin. Arthur laughed and said, <laughs> Jesus, I don't want it back now. That was never part of the trick before, letting it touch your balls. If I had known that, I'd have just given you a regular quarter. Will kept offering it back, and Arthur said, No, 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 it's all yours now. It didn't touch my balls, Art, it was hidden in my hand. That's the trick. Still, I want you to keep it. Seriously. Will's face froze. He wasn't touched by this gesture, or amused, or grateful. His eyes were watching Arthur carefully, unblinking, trying to read the man. Art, what's going on? Don't make a big deal of it. The whole lucky coin bit. It was a silly affection. I'm not even superstitious, you know that. It was just a conversation starter. I can't even do tricks with it, not like you. You keep it up, make up an interesting backstory. Tell girls in bars you got off a soldier in Korea or something. Then do that magic trick and you'll hear panties dropping from across the room. Another pause. Those blue eyes watching. The brain behind them running through scenarios. Finally, Will said, Why don't I come with you? We're not having that conversation again. Seen demanded confidentiality on this thing, and I don't want to spook him. As soon as we have a working device we can take to market, trust me, he'll be the first to see a demonstration. As for this, it's probably nothing. Called it in a bit of a panic, but the scene panics over everything. He's always paranoid the government is going to finally come after him. Are they? I'll see you back at the house, and stop worrying. Life's too short. The camera tracked with Arthur as he stood up and closed the door of the car. Zoe saw it was Will's Aston Martin, and a warehouse came into view as Arthur turned to face it. Presumably, this was the building as it had existed before the mysterious event that turned it into a charred crater. He took several steps towards a back door and dug into his front pocket for a set of keys. When his hand emerged, it was holding his lucky coin, Will having slipped it back to him at some point, using some sort of sleight of hand. Arthur barked out a laugh. He turned to see the Aston Martin's taillights vanishing around a corner. The feed cut to black, then a split second later, Zoe thought the glasses were just glasses again. The view was of the bedroom, as seen from right where she was sitting, but there was still a date stamp hovering in the corner, marked as having been recorded ten days ago, and the room was no longer in disarray. She was just watching a feed that had been recorded from the very spot where she was watching it. Zoe flinched as a hand came up into view, as if she had a phantom limb. The hand was holding Arthur's lucky coin, the other hand came into view, and he tried to do Will's magic trick. The coin tumbled into Arthur's lap. Arthur's voice said, I hope I've done this right. 
if I'm headed toward, well, what I think I'm heading to, then there's a better than ever chance this will be my last day. And that's okay, because if I do this right, I'll spend this last day saving the world. Granted, I'll be saving it from something I myself unleashed, so, you know, don't build any monuments to me for it. He let out a long breath and said, All right, no speeches. Let's just do it. The view jumped inside a cavernous building, which Zoe assumed was the warehouse she'd previously only seen from the outside. Arthur strolled between rows of tall metal shelves, three stories of bags and boxes and barrels looming overhead. He passed a row of dormant forklifts plugged into wall chargers before finally arriving at a utility closet full of janitor supplies. He issued a voice command that caused the back wall of the closet to slide open, revealing an elevator. Arthur went down one floor, then down a hall and through a full-body scan security airlock, the scanner between a series of steel doors thick enough to blunt a nuclear warhead. This, Zoe realized, was the real warehouse. Everything above it was camouflage. When the final door rumbled open, Arthur was greeted by a massive blood stain that covered the concrete floor. Zoe heard a sigh from Arthur, saddened by what he was about to see, but not surprised. He stepped cautiously around the crimson stain, and the view panned over to see a toppled wheelchair that was also soaked in blood, tossed against one wall. Arthur found Sane's legs jutting out from behind a crate. Then the view panned around again and found Sane's torso sprawled behind a forklift across the room. Arthur moved slowly but deliberately into the room, entering a space full of workbenches and elaborate machines, some of which were the size of houses, one shaped like a big robotic caterpillar. He crossed the room and approached one more doorway, this one standing open. Behind it came the muffled sound of giggling and wet, ripping noises. Arthur and his camera passed into a long open room that looked like a shooting range. At one end hung four pig carcasses, dangling from meat hooks. Standing among them was a young guy who had his back to them. He was shirtless with long, flowing blonde hair, wearing a backward baseball cap and jeans. He bulged with tanned muscles. He looked like he'd borrowed the photoshopped body of a model on a billboard. Zoe would forever have to live with the fact that this was her first impression of Molech, admiring his rippling back muscles, beach tan biceps, and a perfect butt under worn jeans. And she was sure this was Molech, mainly because he had the letters M-O-L-E-C-H tattooed across his back. In Molech's right hand was another hand, most of an arm actually, Everything from the elbow up, as if he had severed it from somebody's body and carried it around as a keepsake. For a horrified moment, Zoe thought he had hacked it off of Sane's corpse, but as the view got closer, it became clear that the severed limb was made of rubber or plastic, a prosthetic. Molech was using it as a weapon. He reached back, shoved the hand through the rib cage of the nearest pig with a crunch of snapping bones. He twisted it around inside, and with a series of wet, sucking squishes, pulled the hand out of the ragged wound which was now clutching a pink and yellow mass of organs in its fist. Molech laughed uproariously and said, Dude, this is orgasmic! He couldn't have been any older than Zoe. There was another man watching with him, a bearded black guy who looked a bit older than Molech, but who probably still hadn't seen 30. Standing around the room were four other muscle men holding shotguns and watching Molech play. There didn't seem to be an ounce of body fat in the room. Molech turned and looked toward Arthur and the camera. He smiled and swung the prosthetic arm toward the floor, discarding the wad of guts with a wet slap. The fingers flexed on their own with a mechanical whir. Artie Livingston, as I live and breathe! Dude, I have to shake your hand! Molech extended the prosthetic limb toward Arthur, as if to shake with it. The mechanical fingers flexed. Molech giggled. Arthur declined the shake and said, I don't believe we've met. Nope, but I bet you've heard of me. They call me Molech. Who's they? Molech gestured toward the black guy with the beard and said, This is my right-hand man, Black Scott. And don't call me racist, that's the name he gave himself. In the background, Black Scott shook his head and silently mouthed, Nope. Oh, and sorry about your friend back there. It was self-defense, I swear. Dude kept trying to run me over in his wheelchair. And by that point, the juice was flowing, and dude, you gotta ride it out. Know what I'm saying? Did Sane let you in here? Molech used the mechanical hand to scratch his chin and said, He didn't, the ingrate. And we go way back, too. See, a while back I put in a bid for all his awesome toys, but some rich bastard outbid me. You wouldn't know anything about that, would you? 
Molech walked over to an empty oil drum, grabbed it with a disembodied hand, and watched as the fingers effortlessly tore a chunk out of the side, the metal squealing as it ripped like construction paper. Molech giggled until he couldn't breathe. So, who did let you in? Not everybody on your team is as loyal as you think, Artie. See, there's two ways of keeping everybody in line. They can be scared of you, or they can be your buddy. Sounds to me like you did it the second way. The problem with that is they turn on you the moment you piss them off. Me? Oh, I run a tight ship. Everyone knows the score. Stick with me? You live like a king. You cross me? I put your ass in hell. So, what can I do for you? You've already done it, my man. You just don't know it. Though I gotta say, you got a way better setup in here than I got. Way more floor space. So, you have your own workshop? Someone linked the Raiden tech to you? Was it sane? Dude, I'm so juiced out I can barely think straight. You ever felt it, Artie? You ever felt the juice? Or has it been so long that you don't remember? I suspect you intend to kill me, Molech. But I can tell you now that I think there's more to be gained by keeping me alive. I'm a man of means, and even if Sing was leaking designs to you, you don't have everything. I don't think you really want to do what you came to do. What I don't want don't matter, don't you see? I serve the juice. We all do, even if we try to deny it. Are you trying to tell me you're high? Because that has never stopped me from negotiating before. Nah, juice is a natural high, man. First time I felt it, I was out hunting with my daddy. See, the way he hunted, you don't pack no food for the trip. You stay gone for a month, and the hunting grounds are a two-day hike from the car. You only eat what you kill, see? That's the idea. So, my first time, we shot nothing for three days, and he was starving at that point. I cried and begged, out there in the woods in Montana. There's the two of us, begging him to take me home, to take me to McDonald's. I got so hungry, I tried to catch and eat some crickets that had gotten into my tent. They got away, and I just cried like a little baby. Old man heard me and beat the piss out of me. <laughs> And he sits down and looks me in the eye and my old man told me how it was. Told me you gotta let the hunger drive you, to motivate you. Next morning, I'm laying awake up in a tree and a big old wild boar comes grunting through the bush down below. The gun is shaking in my hand. I know if I miss, that may be it for me. I might get too weak to hunt, might die out there in the woods in the wet and the cold. But I shoot and the shot goes true. And when that thing fell over, I felt it, man. I felt the juice. The adrenaline, the dopamine, all that pumping through my veins and brains and my balls. I had won. We built a fire and gutted and cooked that bastard when my teeth sank into that tough, charred meat. <sighs> that was the first time I'd ever really eaten. The first time I was ever really alive. I was ten years old. Molich watched as the mechanical prosthetic flexed its fingers, mesmerized. He continued. My daddy told me what I was feeling. He says, man evolved to have these juices that flow through your body to reward you for doing something good. All them hormones, the dopamine, the adrenaline, the true drugs. You get that high, the real high, when your body knows you did something to advance survival, not just yours, but the species, man. When you want to fight or kill some food or bane a chick. And he tells me how now all my friends are living off fake highs, smoking meth or playing video games or jerking it to porn. All these little tricks to try to trigger the juice without earning it. Fake sex, fake danger, fake victories. But if we're going to survive, he says, we got to get back to the true juice. Get rid of all that other nonsense and live the way we was intended. Muscle, blood, sweat. There was silence in the room that was broken by Molich snorting a sudden, crazy burst of laughter. Arthur said calmly, We're both businessmen, Molich. You're a businessman. Oh, I'm just a man. All right, how about I put it like this? I'm a realist. I know what you're capable of, and I know I don't have any choice but to cooperate. A man like me doesn't survive this long without knowing which way the wind is blowing. Molich tossed the mechanical arm from one hand to the other grinning that stupid grin. Yeah, like one of them fat fish that sits on the bottom of the river and just waits for worms to flow by, right? Just sitting there, eating up everything that comes your way, getting fatter. But you know what I am? I'm a shark. Molech swung with his real hand and connected with a blow that landed with a sickening crack of bone. Zoe jumped. The camera's view spun and whirled, showing floor and then ceiling. Molech loomed over Arthur. Nah, you know what? I thought of a better animal for you. You're a panda. 
You hear about that? The way they had him in zoos trying to force him to hump because they wouldn't do it themselves. See, a long time ago, the pandas forgot they were bears. Stopped hunting, stopped fighting, started eating leaves instead of meat. They let the juice dry up and pretty soon the pandas were all gone too. If it was up to people like you, we humans would go the same way. Well, I've decided I'm going to go ahead and save the world. Arthur gasped and tried to say, Listen, listen to me, it's not too late. Molech said, Let's hope not. And then Molech struck again, and again, and again, each time with that horrible crunch of impact. Then, he grabbed the mechanical arm and reached down. They were wet, ripping noises. Zoe yanked off the glasses. She stood up, tried to catch her breath, then ran into the bathroom and threw up. 22. Armando appeared in the door of the bathroom with his gun drawn, because in his world, even a vomiting woman was apparently a problem that could be cured with a well-placed bullet. Zoe told him she was fine, and he kind of awkwardly put his hand on her shoulder, as if he had seen somebody do it on TV once. Zoe shrugged him off, flushed, gathered herself, and was about to speak when Carlton appeared in the doorway and asked if all was well. Zoe hesitated. Molech flat out told Arthur he had a traitor on his team, and he apparently wasn't referring to Sane, because Sane was already in multiple pieces when he said it. If he wasn't just playing mind games, then the traitor was someone close enough to know the secret codes, or keys, that would get him into a structure built like a nuclear bunker. Aside from the suits, who else could have that kind of access? Could it be Carlton? Zoe said, I'm fine. Can you give us a minute? Carlton left, and Zoe told Armando, I just watched a blink of Arthur Livingston getting murdered by Molech with a disembodied mechanical arm after the latter stole a bunch of magic weapons from the former. Armando furrowed his brow as he tried to untangle the sentence. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I mean, it was awful, but I saw Molech's face clearly. Everybody has left, but we can call... Wait, there's more. Before I killed him... Molech said there was a traitor on Arthur's team. Do you think he was telling the truth or just making a play? I don't know. What do I do? Call Will. How do we know he's not the traitor? We can't ever know anything for sure, but I'd say he's by far the least likely to betray Arthur, and he definitely wouldn't do it on Molech's behalf. I don't know Will, but I know enough about him to say that with some confidence. Maybe Molech forced him, threatened him into doing it. <laughs> you don't know Will. Zoe thought back to the beginning of the second video, Will escorting Arthur, seemingly in the dark. If he had known at the time what was about to happen, the man hid it well. Oh, what about the rest of them? Armando ran his hand through his hair, thinking, All I know is what I pick up from the grapevine, you understand. So, Echo hasn't been here as long as the rest, so there is that to consider. But the thing with the suits... You're better off assuming that everything they present to you is a mirror image of the truth. That's their game. If you want to know who to be afraid of, start with who seems to have worked hardest to earn your trust. Well, that's definitely not Echo, Zoe considered. That first night, it was Andre who came and found me, to talk me down. Knowing what little I know, Zoe, I would not... Well, I was about to say I would not turn my back on him, but this is Tabula Rasa... You do not turn your back on anyone here. Zoe made a decision. Will arrived at the casa ten minutes later. They watched the glasses video together on the mold room's wall display. Zoe warned Will about the graphic nature of the ending and offered to simply describe it to him so he wouldn't have to watch his friend get gutted by a backward cap-wearing frat boy. But Will insisted on watching it, which didn't surprise her. Will showed no emotion. Right up to, and including the moment when Arthur met his gruesome end. He let the video play out, then replayed it, stopping it at various points as if to notice minute details he'd missed the last time around. After he watched the video six times, he paused it on a clear view of Molech's face, then got up to pour himself a drink. Will muttered, Just a kid. Looked like he had to skip a frat party to be there. After all that, after all these years, just some goddamned kid. Did you recognize him? No, but either Bud will know who he is, or we can run him through facial recognition. Either way, we'll have his real name by morning. The first time I watched it, I thought Molech kept saying he served the Jews. So did I. I bet his real name is Chad. He looks like one. 
Did you hear the part where Arthur asked him how he got into the building? And he said that somebody on the team had betrayed him. Yes, I picked up on that, Zoe. So, who is it? Will thought for a moment and said, Why were you so sure it wasn't me? Armando, he said you had too much history with Arthur. Did he tell you the story of how we met? No. Good. So who is it? Nobody in the inner circle. Not Carlton either. Are you sure? Maybe somebody else who worked for it? No. I will stake my life on it. I'm not using that as a figure of speech. I am telling you I am literally going to stake my life on it tomorrow. If anyone was going behind our back, I'd know. End of discussion. So these gadgets. The stuff that gives you murderous superpowers. Arthur is the one who unleashed it on the world. It would appear so. And you actually knew that this whole time, didn't you? Will set his glass on the conference table, then made like he was packing up to leave. Not the exact details, no, but enough to know whatever he was working on was dangerous in the wrong hands. Bodies started turning up, and it was clear Arthur was involved from the way he acted. Wouldn't talk to us about it, though, because at some point he decided he didn't know who he could trust, including me. After everything, he still wasn't sure I wasn't going behind his back. Will worked his jaw, grinding his molars, trying to push down rage and sadness before they bubbled up to where the world could see them. He almost got his face back to that of a chiseled and passive robot. Almost. Zoe said, I'm sorry. For what? For your loss. I should have said that. You said it to me the first time you called me, but that was stupid. It was your loss, not mine. I, I should have realized that. Will waved her off. No, it's fine. Anyway, that's why there was such a mad scramble for his vault key. We were trying to piece together what exactly he had been up to, because it seemed so apocalyptic. What we were hoping to find in there were the schematics, or some prototypes, anything. Backups. Hoping it hadn't all gone up with the warehouse. Then, we finally get it open, and uh, you know the rest. But that doesn't make sense either. Molech has the gadgets. He's the one person who had no need to get into the vault. He should be happy, right? You saw the video. He won. He got what he wanted. Well, now he wants the gold. Whatever that is. Will finished his drink and said, He's apparently going to tell us all tomorrow, so there's that. <laughs> if he doesn't just kill us all first. 23. Zoe woke up and for a blissful moment thought she was back home and was waking up from an exceptionally weird dream. And then she realized she was in some kind of strange bed that she could actually roll over in without running into either a wall or a hot water heater. Then the dead silence registered, that eerie feeling like she was the last human on earth. Nobody arguing outside, not even the sound of her mom clinking pans around in the kitchen. There could be a war raging outside the gates of the estate, and not a peep would reach Zoe's bedroom. She had forgotten about the talking toilet, and the startled fart she gave when it spoke up was interpreted as consent to show her the morning's alarming news. The lead story was the terror threat surrounding the upcoming memorial service in Tabula Rasa, showing video of the city's park, where crews were already setting up for what looked less like a funeral service and more like a massive winter music festival. Were they inflating a bouncy castle out there? The next story was new to Zoe. A ten-foot-tall bronze statue of Arthur Livingston had been stolen from its perch in front of an art gallery, except in a gaudy statue was apparently the cost of taking a large donation from the man by a pair of muscular men with some kind of flying apparatus on their backs. Neither of them were Molech, but there was no doubt who they worked for. The statue was hauled a few blocks away to the financial district, where there sat a life-size bronze statue of a bull. The two men spent the next hour using blasts of electricity to weld the Livingston statue to the bull in a position that made it appear he was having interspecies relations with it. The task took much longer than necessary because both men couldn't stop giggling or pausing every five minutes to flex for the crowd. Finally, their work done, the men had stuck their arms in the air and zipped off into the sky, trailing tails of electric blue light. One second later, they both went spiraling off in different directions and crashed into nearby buildings. Zoe assumed that hadn't been part of the plan. She turned it off, and when she wandered out of the guest room, she was immediately accosted by Carlton, asking to make her breakfast. Her stomach was a knot, so instead, she handed off to him the job of feeding stench machine. If Carlton considered this task below him, he showed no sign. 
They headed down the grand staircase, and at the bottom, Zoe found Armando, who was sitting in the lotus position on the floor, cleaning a gun he had taken apart and spread on a dirty towel. There seemed to be a ritualistic aspect to what he was doing, a ceremony to calm the nerves. Zoe didn't bother him. She wandered into the kitchen, where there was a brown paper package sitting on the bar, the delivery of freshly roasted espresso beans Arthur had flown in every week. Zoe smelled them, swooned, and headed over to the kitchen's coffee bar and dumped them in a grinder. She didn't even want espresso, she just wanted to go through the process of making it. She started grinding beans and asked Carlton if he wanted something. He declined because accepting such a thing from his employer would probably violate some sacred code of his profession. She yelled the same offer to Armando and he said yes, which almost made Zoe giddy. She started warming up the machine. Armando strode into the kitchen and Zoe asked him, How many people are going to be there, at the memorial? He shrugged. Over the course of the night, maybe a hundred thousand? It's open to the public. Crowds will wash in and out of the park all night. And a Livingston drop party has a way of spilling out across the city. A what party? It's a city-wide festival Arthur would throw whenever he could invent a suitable excuse. It shuts down the whole downtown area. Traffic is always a disaster. Still, sounds pretty cool as far as funerals go. Unless you are trying to organize security around a known assassination target, in which case it becomes a logistical nightmare. Zoe poured steamed milk into Armando's drink, drew a dragon into the foam with the nozzle of the steamer, not a toothpick. She didn't cheat, and slid the mug over to him. There, try that. He took a sip, completely failing to notice the design she had etched into it, and said, Oh, wow, that uh, has a uh, kick. It's a cafe mocha with cinnamon and a dash of cayenne pepper. The liquor is right over there if you want to Irish it up. She started wiping down the equipment when she had a thought. I wonder if I should call in for work on Monday. Armando said, Work? Well, I'm supposed to open at the Java Lodge Monday morning. They're not open on Sundays, so if there's a good chance I'll get killed tonight, that means I need to call today to get somebody to trade with me. Armando just stared. Zoe dug out her phone and dialed. She got the voicemail of her manager, Aria, and said, Hey, this is Zoe. I'm still in Tabula Rasa for that funeral, and, uh, there's a chance I won't be in on Monday morning. Can you see if Shell can cover for me? Tell her, uh, I'll give her $10,000. That's not a joke. Tell her if she gives me her account number, I can send the money at any time. Oh, and tell her to remember to change the floor sign. All the holiday flavors go back to regular price this week except for the peppermint. Goodbye. Zoe hung up, thought for a moment, then said, I wonder if I should call my mom. Nah, I think I'd just freak her out. I mean, how do I say goodbye without scaring her? Armando said, Zoe, we are going to do everything we can to... Zoe turned her back to him and said to Carlton, Will you take care of Cinch Machine? I'm sorry. My cat, that's his name. If I don't come back from this thing, will you feed him? And find him a home if you don't want him? Cats were never my mom's thing. Well, I could... He doesn't just need a roof. He needs to be with someone who loves him. He'll want to sleep in the bed with you. Before Carlton could formulate a response to this, it was clear that he and Armando both wished they could just flee the room. Bud, Will, and Andre filed in. Zoe asked, Where's Echo? Will said, At the park, installing about seven million dollars worth of hardware. Zoe asked if they wanted coffee. Will said no. Bud asked for Folgers, Crystals, Black. Andre asked for six shots of espresso with three shots of peanut butter cheesecake syrup with whipped cream and chocolate shavings on the top. Zoe got to work. Will said, I showed them the video. And? Bud said, Real name is Chet Campbell, Zoe said. Oh, I was so close. Son of Rex Campbell, arms dealer. I hadn't seen him since he was a boy, but it's him. Armando said, I'm not familiar. Bud said, Rex was before your time. Douchebag gunrunner from Oregon. Used to specialize in making exotic guns and ammo for high-end thugs. Gold-plated assault rifles, shotgun shells full of acid, that sort of thing. Crazy survivalist type. Came here in the early days to flood the streets with military surplus iron. Wound up skimming from a deal with the Russian mob. They caught him and cut off his head. Stuck it on the front of his Marauder 4x4 like a hood ornament. He would have left a nice chunk of change behind for Chet, though. And plenty of connections for him to pick up the family business. Will said, The tech he stole from Arthur will make him more money in five minutes than dear old dad made in his whole gun-running career. Armando said, Frankly, I am surprised the mob left Chet alive at all. Boys in that situation tend to grow up angry. 
He would prefer they not appear at your door ten years later. Bud said, Oh, they tried to take him out. Chet couldn't have been more than twelve at the time. He not only got away, but stayed gone. Everybody just assumed they got him at some point. But then all these years later, sure enough, we started hearing about a lot of dead Russians with exotic wounds. People started whispering the name Molich. Little Chet Campbell, all grown up and making a name for himself. Zoe said, Exotic wounds caused by exotic gadgets that you gave him. I just want to reiterate that this is Arthur Livingston's mess we're cleaning up here. Will said, And we will clean it up. Bud said, Even though cleaning up Arthur's messes is such an unusual and alien experience for all of us. The point, said Andre, is that this is what we do. Candy appeared in the room and said there were five men with very large guns at the gate, insisting they were associates of Armando Ruiz, along with a flamboyantly dressed man named Trey, who insisted that he was Zoe's personal fashion designer. Zoe wasn't sure which of those alarmed her more. Andre clapped his hands, picked up his mug, and said, All right, let's get ready for a funeral. 24. Andre said, Zoe, this is Trey, my brother. He's going to fix you up. He does all our suits, Lean's outfits too. They were all up in Arthur's hidden third floor suite, standing in the massive closet that could have comfortably accommodated a dozen more people. Armando, as always, watched the door. Trey's own outfit was not inspiring confidence in Zoe. He was wearing a suit made of crimson leather, the shirt unbuttoned to his navel. Several gold chains were draped across a well-muscled and well-waxed chest. He said, Pleasure to meet you, Miss Ash. Dandre, he said, Damn, you was right. Gonna have fun dressing her. Will said, We're going for confidence here. I don't want her dressed like she's coming in nervous or armored or ready to run. I want her dressed like she's going to a party without a care in the world. We want to sow doubt about why she's so confident. I suggest something tight, with heels. Zoe said, I think you're blurring the line between strategy and your own perverse fantasies, Will. He wouldn't take the bait, choosing instead to lean in one corner and engross himself in his phone. Andre rolled his eyes. I'm going to leave y'all to it. Now, Zoe, keep in mind, Trey's not gay. Don't let him linger with the measuring tape. He's just using that as an excuse to put his hands on you. He'll act like he forgot the numbers. Don't fall for it. Trey said, I resent that. I'm a professional. You resent it because it's the truth. Andre left and Armando said, Do you want me to close the door? Meaning with me on the other side of it. No, you can stay. In case Trey turns out to be an assassin, just turn your head if there's nudity. This prospect seemed to alarm Armando quite a bit. Trey said, So I brought a selection with me, and if you don't like what I've got, I'll go get more. You trust me to take your measurements without feeling you up, or has my brother already poisoned the well in this relationship? Can I not just pick out something on my own? I'm not six years old. I can dress myself. Girl, please don't take this as an insult, because you are a lovely young lady, and it is people with a rich inner life and transcendental spirit who tend to neglect their outer appearance. But that said, you're wearing eight items of clothing, and at least two of them don't fit you. The other six are including your shoes and socks. Your shirt hangs like a maternity dress. You're going out in public. Gonna be people watching from all over the world. You gotta show off the goods. I absolutely do not have to do that. And it's not my fault nothing fits. I have a weird body. This shirt isn't supposed to be this low cut. It's just that everything is designed for somebody six inches taller. So what's a dignified neckline on a normal woman makes me look like I'm supposed to be in a parade in Rio? And that's why you got Trey. You don't gotta buy off the shelf no more. That's the point. We're gonna take what I got and we're gonna make it so it fits Zoe Ash and nobody else on earth. Only thing is, you're gonna realize at all at once how much all your other clothes were made with somebody else in mind. Soon, you won't want to put on pajamas without picking up the phone and calling Trey to tailor them up. Now, let's be frank. I'm obviously gonna start with them titties. See, we dress the girls first, then we can take in the bottom part, bring out them curves. Wow, I don't even... Hold still, I'm gonna measure you up. My mom would be so disappointed. She, hold out your arms. There. She used to say I should pity people who obsess over this type of thing. Who's obsessing? You just want to make a splash, that's all. Okay, again, I absolutely do not want to do that. Better to be looked over than overlooked. You want to walk into that funeral and have every dude in that room whip their head around and say, God damn, them is some fine ass titties. I gotta find me a divorce lawyer in the next five minutes. Wow, I'm just gonna leave. You want every girl in that place to be murderous with jealous rage. Like, I gotta get my man out of here before he sees that and leaves my skinny ass. Why are you laughing? I'm serious. I know you're making fun of me. Armando remained silent across the room, but clearly wanted to be literally anywhere else. 
Will worked on his phone, seeming to have completely forgotten anyone else in the room. Trey said, I'm just trying to relax you, honey. I'm measuring your butt. Don't be alarmed. I don't even know why I'm laughing. I'm probably going to die tonight. Get me a dress that won't make me look ridiculous when they show my body on the news. That's all I want. You got dark thoughts, girl. Trey started sorting through a rolling rack of dress bags he'd brought, and as he was grabbing one, Zoe said, Don't give me anything that doesn't have pockets. Trey paused, put it back, then pulled out a different bag that turned out to be a surprisingly dignified black blazer and skirt. Zoe said, Oh, well, that's not too bad. Thank you for believing in me. Can you try this top for me? I can leave the room while you change, but if you don't want me to see you in your bra, but for real, I am a professional here. Think of me like a doctor. I do this every day. It's fine. She made a twirling motion at Armando, who not only turned his head, but turned his whole body to face the wall, like a little kid. Will kind of had his back to them anyway, hunched over his phone and muttering something to Echo's worried holographic head. The other three people in the room could form a naked human pyramid and it'd take him an hour to notice. Zoe pulled off her t-shirt and immediately Trey said, Damn, them's the type of titties they wrote songs about. Zoe covered her chest with the, with the shirt and said, Okay, you're not actually a designer, are you? Go on, I'm just playing. By the way, make that three atoms of clothing that don't fit you. Oh, what's that on your shoulder? Zoe glanced at her back in the mirror, but didn't need a see to know what he was referring to. Her rainbow scar. Four curved lines of pale, knotted flesh swooping from her shoulder blade to her armpit. What does it look like? Guess. It's a scar, right? Well, duh. What kind? What does it look like to you? Like a big animal clawed you. You get in a fight with a bear? No. See how it's perfectly round? Like the burner on an electric stove top? What, did you fall in the oven while it was on? Sort of. One of my mom's boyfriends, he held me down on the kitchen counter with a steak knife to my throat, shoved me on the burners, leaned all his weight on me and turned it on. Then we both laid there while it got hotter and hotter. Burned through my shirt. Burned through my shoulder. There was actual smoke. Caught my hair on fire, too. It set off the smoke alarm, and he just laid on top of me, grinning the whole time. He wasn't a nice guy. There was silence all around, as there always was when the, she told this story. Even Will had glanced up from his phone to try to figure out what drama had stopped the room. Without turning away from the wall, Armando said, This man... Is he still around? Don't know. This was several years ago. He went to jail, not for that, but for something related. But I'm sure by now he's probably gotten out and then got put back in for something else. Armando asked, What was his name? Why? You think you know him? Armando shrugged. Maybe I want to get to know him. Maybe I should drop in and say hello. Maybe show him what a hot stove feels like against his scumbag face. <laughs> then we all go to jail. When a billionaire makes a career scumbag disappear, no one goes to jail. A man like that, I could do him in the parking lot of the police station and they could send me a fruit basket at Christmas. Anyway, that's why I can't wear tank tops. Trey said, But it saves you a lot of time shaving them armpits. You ever wear a shaping top like this? No? It's gonna feel weird. Just roll that down to your hips like you're putting on a giant rubber. It's a polyethylene blend that'll kind of shape itself to your... Yeah, like that. I... I don't think I can breathe in this. Yeah, that's normal. That's only because it's squishing all of your organs together. I got tights in here for the bottom half, but we're not worried about that right now. See that? You just lost like 12 pounds there. See, this is why us humans invented clothes. Hides all the workouts we skipped. Put the jacket on? Nice. Here, put your arms down so I can mark the sleeves. Perfect. Take a look in the mirror. We'll bring that into the waist, like this, so it's got that slimming effect, right? Oh, wow. That's not bad. Got a little bit of collar gap back here. We'll take care of that. Like Will's suit. See how everything fits smooth and flat against his neck? No wrinkles or anything around the shoulders or bottoms? Here, put the skirt on. You're not watching this part. You've lost that privilege. Turn around. Trey made a show of turning around and covering his eyes with both hands. She changed, gave the all clear, and Trey said, Yeah. Hold, hold still. See, we'll bring it right above the knee, like this. Probably don't want it any tighter than that, or, or I start to look like a sausage. She looked herself over in the mirror. Trey said, Admit I know what I'm doing. It looks good. See? Look like a dignified businesswoman and, and yet still gonna have you showing up in a hundred dudes wank fantasies tonight. Trey, please. Armando, what do you think? He turned away from the wall and came up behind her. It looks very nice. Trey said, He means it too. 
Don't know if you noticed, but his eyes made two stops. He looked at the mirror a second, but he looked at your butt first. See, that's what we're going for. My god, I'm gonna have to take a long shower after this. Will approached, studied the mirror like a doctor diagnosing a patient, and said, And you'll have her in heels, correct? I want the subconscious impression that she can't run away. And that would also mean I can't actually run away, correct? I think any plan that relies on your foot speed is probably not a sound one. She nodded toward his drink glass and said, Right, just like any plan that relies on your sobriety. To Trey, she said, Do you have a different top? Aside from the fact that this one is probably squeezing my liver to death, it seems like this is showing a lot of boob for a funeral. One, it's not a funeral. It's a memorial service in the park. And two, girl, this is Arthur Livingston's memorial service. You'll be showing the least amount of boob there. We'll get you a necklace. Maybe pearls or a nice gold cross to come down right here. It'll be classy, trust me. Even your mama would like it. She would not. She's a hippie, says we're ruining the world because we throw out perfectly good clothes and cars just because we want to keep up appearances. She used to say that mankind would rather look good and die than look bad and live. Trey shook his head. Girl, style is the only thing that separates us from the animals. A bird or a bear? All it's got is the feathers and fur it's born with. But a human? We can take our crazy imagination and wear them on our sleeve. The only tragedy is not everybody can afford to bring out that natural expression of beauty. So now I'm not trailer trash anymore because I can afford a guy to dress me? Girl, you were never trailer trash. Your circumstances just forced you to dress like it. Now take that off and let me make the alterations. Chantrell will be here in a minute to do hair and makeup. Wait, what? Bye bye. I wish you luck, but in that outfit, you ain't gonna need it. 25. Zoe had literally once quit a job because it required her to wear a skirt and pantyhose every day. She always felt like her whole lower body was being slowly strangled, and the boobs-to-toe body-shaping garments Trey had her squeeze into were much, much worse. She shuffled toward the grand staircase and saw that below her, the mansion had become a raucous gun party full of burly men chatting in circles and guzzling hopefully non-alcoholic drinks, comparing gear, and sharing anecdotes that were punctuated with hand gestures demonstrating acts of violence. She headed down the stairs thinking it would be hilarious if the heels caused her to tumble down and break her neck in front of 50 men who'd been hired to protect her. Andre and Armando intercepted her at the bottom of the stairs. Andre was in a black suit that gave little whispers of purple, the colors hidden in the pinstripes and in subtle shades that revealed themselves when the light hit his tie and pocket square. Little splashes of flamboyance in his somber morning clothes. Damn, traded right by you. You don't even gotta say anything. I can tell by look on your face. You're like, I know I look good. We all know it. End of discussion. You can tell him he did a good job. I'm sure he really needs the self-esteem boost. But frankly, I, I think it's kind of weird how much you guys care how I look. Andre held out his hands in a look-around-you gesture. I don't know if you noticed, but presentation is kind of our thing. Now admit it, that's the best you've looked since your prom night. I wore pajamas on prom night. Nobody asked me to dance. Andre looked her up and down and said, Well, I just now found out that you went to an all-white high school. What does that mean? Armando pushed past him and said, Follow me. We're going over the plan. They shouldered past the armed men in the foyer, then had to wait for a stream of guys filing out of the dining room, each with long guns strapped to their backs. Zoe said, Actually, I wonder if my ex-boyfriend Caleb has heard about all this. Armando said, There are people living in mud huts who have heard about this. Andre said, You think he'll come a-calling? It was an ugly breakup. He cheated on me and I stabbed him in the crotch with a pair of scissors. That got Armando's attention. Zoe laughed and said, No, not really. He just upgraded. Andre said, What do you mean? They shuffled into the crowded dining room, where the sprawling table was now covered in weapons, men tinkering with rifles and loading them with gleaming bullets that were as long as her hand. Did they think they were going to be attacked by bears? She said, He was in college when we met, in business school. I was waiting tables at a Cracker Barrel. We moved in together after a year, but then all of his future MBA buddies start picking out the sorority girls they were going to marry, and it became obvious that a future businessman destined to make six figures needed something way thinner and blonder than me. He was actually really nice about it. He got me a gym membership for Christmas, kept buying salad ingredients to keep around the house. He really did want it to work, offered to pay me to get my teeth fixed. Andre said, you can't take it personal. Sometimes the fire just goes out. I should know. It's happened to me with four wives so far. 
They had to pause at the doorway to the hall, where a parade of four men walked in hauling boxes that were alarmingly full of medical supplies, wound dressing kits, emergency burn care, disinfectant. As they headed toward the mold room door, Zoe said, But that's the thing. When the lights were out, everything was the way it was before. I don't want to get gross or anything, but there's no way the new girl does, you know, the things I did. My mom taught tantric sex classes out of our trailer, always creepy naked people with tattoos in the living room. I know my way around a dude. I learned this massage technique. I swear, Caleb actually blacked out one time. I thought I was going to have to call an ambulance. His balls were... Zoe realized they had timed their conversation just so that everyone in the conference room could hear the last part. She said, Never mind. Andre raised an eyebrow. So, what are you doing after the service? She sighed and said, Decomposing? Armando went to the back of the room to grab some equipment. Will and Echo were seated at the table in their assigned chairs, examining a tiny object and muttering an argument about it. Will was in a dark gray suit jacket the color of a charcoal drawing, with a white shirt and a dark tie with the slightest silver shimmer to it, looking as always like he would clink if you tapped him with a fork. Echo had been poured into a dress that was made of exactly one piece of black stretchy fabric sewn into a tube and looked like she could stop traffic three cities away. Zoe thought the least Echo could have done was dress down so as not to upstage her boss, then sadly realized that she had tried to do just that. Andre said to Zoe, I'm just playing, but seriously, listen up because this is important and this is where we'll leave it. Your boy? My guess is he never stopped thinking you were beautiful. The only thing that changed was he started worrying that other people didn't think you were. So now he's going to spend his life with a gorgeous, boring woman who'll make him miserable, all so that he can wear her on her arm to parties, thinking that'll show other people how great he is. He'll pick the career and car and mansion that he thinks other people expect him to have, put all his energy into building up that front. Then one day he'll find out his life is all wrapping paper and no gift. Though that would be a perfect gift for a cat, noted Zoe. So you're saying what he really wants is a skinny fashion model he can tote around at parties, then swap her out for one of me when the doors are closed and the lights are out. I know a half dozen dudes got that very arrangement going. Armando was back. He picked the tiny object off the table and said, Ideally, we would have 30 days to work out the logistics of this operation, but here, hold still. He leaned close to Zoe, pushed her hair aside, and placed a tiny, clear piece of tubing along the back of her ear. He ran his finger along her earlobe to press the adhesive backing into place. What's that? Echo said, This will let us hear each other, and we'll be able to track you. We have equipment to detect if there is a firearm within 500 yards of your location, but of course we don't know that they're going to have guns. If you do get taken, just cooperate. We will be able to track you the entire time. Armando said, Our problem is that none of what we are doing here will be a surprise to Molechur's people. He has, all, he has told us ahead of time to expect him, and he knows we're going to prepare accordingly. And unless he is a fool, he can figure out 90% of what we're doing. These are all standard procedures. Zoe nodded. Right, unless we, like, got a bunch of big catapults and tossed clowns at him or something. Ignoring this, Armando continued. The one thing we cannot stop is the one thing we are also assuming he won't do. Come in with some kind of undetectable exotic weapon or bomb and just take us all out. Our one advantage is that he needs something from you, and we are assuming that is not just a ploy. Well, that's only twice you use the word assuming in that spiel, so it sounds like we're on solid ground. So let's say he flies down into the middle of the park in a big hot air balloon in the shape of his head and demands this gold from me. Then what? You shoot him? Will piped up. That would actually be our second best option. The best would be to turn this into a negotiation. I'll be the negotiator. Why is that better than just shooting him? Zoe, this is taking place in a crowded public park. There may be children there. In the real world, bullets that miss their targets keep traveling until they hit something. They fly through windows and into the bodies of bystanders. And even successfully killing a bad guy creates blowback, sets off a whole chain of consequences that are impossible to predict. Guns always represent a failure of negotiation. So, what do I do? You're going to play dumb. I won't be playing. And I'll make it clear that any conversation or confrontation between you and he is a dead end. You don't know what he wants or how to get it. You'll hand it off to me. Armando will get you to safety. The rest is my problem. If it goes wrong from there, well, then we do it the ugly way. And if he doesn't go for any of this and just tries to stab me to death? Armando said, If he makes a move, hit the deck. Go flat on the ground. 
Don't get between Molech and the many bullets that are going to be flying in his direction. Zoe took a breath and said, All right, and we don't know when he's going to show up. Will said, or if he's even going to show at all. Well, how long does the memorial last? All night. Okay, so what do I do the rest of the time? From behind her, Andre said, It's a party. You're rich and famous. You mingle and have fun. Zoe felt a sinking in her gut. Well, let's just hope he shows up and tries to kill me near the start. Armando put a hand on her shoulder and looked her in the eye. Hey, you'll be fine. Let's go do it. Zoe sighed and said, All right, I have to go say goodbye to my cat.